Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to my session, a uh, case study on whitehouse.gov, the acquisition for this. Um, so my name is Tracy Walker, and I am now part of the US Digital Service, and that's at the Office of Management and Budget. But previously, before I joined that team, I was working as a contracting officer at the Executive Office of the President for the last, I think, seven years now. So. Um, kind of did all of their IT purchases, including the, the, the White House contract, as well as several other um, uh, contracts that are all related to both uh, the digital service side as well as the IT side. So kind of getting into this, I'm going to start talking about what we have as actual technical features and the acquisition features of today. Where are we at kind of right now? And then um, how did we get there? So um, the whitehouse.gov website is actually currently being hosted in a FedRAMP certified cloud environment, and it has multi-region high availability, which is really good for disaster recovery and continuity of operations. Um, we do use an open source platform, which is um, Drupal. It's, uh, the software development is all done on an agile software development basis. And this contract also has features in it for um, help desk support, video editing, content delivery network, and content posting. So it was a, uh, the kind of contract that has many multiple services all kind of put together that, that makes sense for what is needed under the White House uh, for the whitehouse.gov. And in terms of the acquisition, what we have right now is that we've done a base uh, blanket purchase agreement utilizing FAR 13.5, which is uh, the ability to use the simplified acquisitions, create a BPA, but because this is a commercial service that we've purchased, it falls under the requirements to, to use that uh, higher ceiling, the $6.5 million ceiling. Um, and we do our task orders basically using the modular contracting approach. So we really don't do a task order for longer than a year. We uh, try to keep them uh, to the period of performance of that or less, depending on what's needed by our customers. And we've turned our, all of our orders underneath this, with the exception of our hosting, is done on a firm fixed price basis. So we really want to pay for the results. And uh, that's very important to both our customers as well as our CFO and our program office as well. Um, so EOP is composed of many different components, like the Office of Management and Budget, the Office of Administration, uh, the White House Office, Office of the Vice President, and each of those have individual funding sources. So we really had to have a way to give them the ability to get development done for their specific parts of the site as well. So the CIO office controls the entire infrastructure and the platform and everything that sits on top of it, but the... Um, uh, components can then say, okay, I need to have a very specific map feature made or, or something along those lines and, and may want to buy their own development cycles for that. So we have that established and set up so that they can do their own ordering as well as having the basic contract which is uh, pro provided to the CIO. Um, and all of these, we actually have gotten it down to the point where we do this on a firm fixed price basis based on the number of cycles that are actually needed. Uh, at this point, we really have kind of gotten away with um, needing to have a full statement of objective, a full statement of work. We just kind of, it's, it's very much a commodity-based kind of thing. I need 10 development cycles, and that'll take me a period of performance of one year, and it costs this much money, because we have that firm fixed price already pre-negotiated, fixed, and understand exactly what we're going to get for that. Um, and then we also use incentive fee, which, uh, which is in there to promote team optimization. And uh, I'll show you in a couple you know, slides where we've gone, where we started, and kind of where we're at now. So. How did we get there? Um, when this administration started, we had to have a contract in place uh, in order for them to have a website changeover on January 20th, uh, 2008. And it had to be exactly at noon. So the transition team came in, and we had at the acquisition team, and w uh, in conjunction with CIO, put together a contract that was, I think, done under millennia, um, GSA's uh, GWAC. And Basically, it just said we don't know exactly what the system requirements are going to be because the transition team is going to come in and tell us what they need the website to look like, but we're going to have a contract in place because there, there would have been no way to get something in, uh, done by the time they actually needed to launch the, the whitehouse.gov. And especially the way that this administration you know, won the, won the election was based on social media, it was based on using technology, and trying to bring that concept into the government was... Uh, 
quite daunting, especially when they walk in and like, hey, I've got great ideas, I want to do this, and we're going, no, we don't know how to do that. So um, what we had in place at the time was a cost plus award fee type contract. And it made a lot of sense because we didn't know what our end goal was going to be, so we didn't know what our, our deliverables were actually going to do. But that ended up kind of being a problem because as we got more mature with the original whitehouse.gov process and, this, and the design and the features that we wanted to release, specifically um, kind of around the, the We the People uh, petition uh, portion of the website, we, we saw that we launched something, it didn't work, and then we kind of had to continually pay the company to fix the things that went wrong in the first place. And so we realized that cost is not necessarily, cost type contract is not the best kind of contract for this when we know that at the end of the day, we need a working website. Uh, we need working features on that website. We need people to be able to log in and, and get their credentials and, and all of this stuff. So we kind of had those set deliverables now. So we really kind of, and I have the, the lion tamer up here because we, we had kind of the contract that had turned into one of those gnarly beasts and we really had to tame it. And so uh, we decided to not exercise an option and kind of go back to the drawing board and say, what do we need to do? So. About this time, uh, a little bit before then, uh, one of um, the people in the CIO who is actually here today, Lee Heyman, he is the, I would say, product owner, manager of the, the whitehouse.gov website from the CIO side. And uh, he loves to come up and give me all kinds of fun challenges. And, and so he was like, all right, well, we want to do a new kind of, of contract with this, but I don't think you can do it. And I'm always up for a challenge, so I'm like, try me. He's like, well, I don't know how much it's going to be. I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know exactly what I want the system to look like. This is agile. Trust me, it's a thing. And uh, so I'm like, uh, okay. And, but he said, uh, but I also want to make sure that we're doing this on kind of a firm fixed price basis because we know we want delivered product over and over and over again. So he introduced me to the concept of Agile, and, and I did a, had to do a lot of self-reading and saying, what is this? And, and so you know, the Agile Manifesto really talks about the, the idea of you know, individuals and interactions, working software, customer collaboration, responding to change. Well, that doesn't really play well in government procurement. And so um, we had to kind of had to go back to the drawing board and figure out what it was that we needed to do. So in order to move forward, we, had, we ended up getting a, uh, a contractor that had, done, had previously worked under the other contract and had their own hosted environment, which was a cloud. So we looked at that and said, OK, we need to bring these services in. They understood Agile. They understood Drupal. They understood um, all of the things that already existed in our environment. So we brought them on and started going through the process of figuring out how we're going to create this contract. And at the time, we used kind of what we call you know, an alpha contracting sessions, where we kind of have our high level objectives, and then we give it to them, and then they come back and say, OK, here's how we would approach this, and then we negotiate that. And at this time, it wasn't a sole source. It was a sole source environment, so we had that flexibility to do that. But it really helped us adopt Agile in our, um, in our culture, in our uh, contracting world, because, of course, we've never done anything like this before. And so everybody from legal and uh, the program side and the contracting side is kind of like, all right, well, if it makes sense, if you can make a good case for this, let's do it. Well, we originally started with the concept of a, of a one-year task order under this blanket purchase agreement, which basically said that we know we're going to have more people ordering this, but let's figure it out. So we started off with baselining. And um, we, we also, as a team, I think, selected which style of Agile was going to be used. Now, the company that we had was very familiar with Agile, but not we hadn't decided necessarily which way it was going to be. So again, Lee came to me and was like, okay, here's a big book. This is called Kanban. Read it. I'm like, it's a little book, apparently. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, and so as a, as a group and as a team together, they decided which way they were going to go in terms of the Agile process. And over that first year, there was definitely a lot of uh, changes to this um, to the Kanban board, and, and I remember walking down uh, after it got started and looking at this and seeing all these stickies all over and lanes and, and all this stuff that had, you know, I have absolutely no way to relate to this in terms of traditional IT contracting. So, you know, the fact that stickies are actually something that
that is useful in this kind of process was blowing my mind. But they also had a bell. So every time you take one of the, um, the sticky notes from one side of the board to the other, and that's actually considered a released um, user story, they'd ring the bell and everybody would celebrate and go on about their day. So um, it, was, it was pretty fun to see when, they were, when the team was going to come up and, and hit that bell. And, and, uh, um, but in terms of contract management, you're kind of going, how do, I, how do I manage this? How do I see this? What are the metrics? It, it's very different from the environment that we'd had before. So uh, over the, this was I think 2012 is when we originally started this. And that first year, we definitely um, just baselined, and I definitely recommend doing that. So if you're new to Agile and if you're new to software development, it might make sense to go out and find like an 8A company or someone where you can have that experience that you grow together as opposed to just jumping right out and saying, hey, I need to do a competition for Agile software development and I want to get something. I mean, there's many ways to do this, but we definitely learned together in this process. And once we learned after the first year, we apply that to all the following subsequent years. And each time we do a new year, we re-evaluate um, where we are, we re-evaluate what the metrics are. And so um, from here, you can see August 2013, we had uh, the Kanban cycle time. And the cycle time is basically how fast are they getting one of those, um, the user stories from one side of the board to the other and getting that functionality completed. And the, and the functionality that is completed is it also is tested, it's quality, you know, it's got quality assurance, it's got the user acceptance testing, it's designed, developed, all of those things are con done within that cycle. So we know the repeated process that's going to provide us with features that, that then can then go and be launched either together as a, uh, you know, many cycles together or sometimes you can release something, you know, an, an easier, uh, maybe not as, as big of a technological challenge and even do that in maybe one cycle. So the, um, the, the cycle time here relates to the, the days that that user story can be processed. So if you see in 2013, uh, we had the target of 22 days, the exceptional is 20 days, and the negative would be 25. So if you've got a team that starts going into the negative and they start hitting 26, 27 consistently, then you know that's where something might be wrong. So either they've let everybody go on vacation or um, maybe there's a problem there. But because we're in a firm fixed price environment, I really don't care what that problem is. I just know that they've got to bring that um, the, the cycle time back to 22 at least to, to be able to do that. Um, and then, as you see, we've optimized the team. The team gets better the longer it stays together. And the more it works, it, it's a collaborative environment. Um, a small team, agile team, should definitely be, you know, between four to ten people. They should not, if you need more work done, you shouldn't throw another, you know, ten bodies in that mix. You need to hire another team and have it as a separate con or a separate process, an agile team, and have them working on a very specific problem to go along with whatever the other one is. But by increasing your team size, you don't necessarily get faster results. And um, you could actually get a lot more bugs. And that's the other thing against with cycle time is that you must track how many defects you're getting out of the system too. Because you're really trying to find that sweet spot where you get the most productivity out of your team and the highest quality. And once you can put those two together, then you've got a very you know, high functioning agile contract. And, and right now, that's where we're at. If you, you know, can see in, in May 2015, we've reduced our target time to 18 days, our exceptional is 16, and our negative is 20. So um, right now, the 20 is what was exceptional two years ago, and that is what, if they start falling below that, that's when we're gonna start saying you've got a problem, you've, we need to start talking about a, you know, contract performance. Um, and I mentioned earlier we have incentive fees. So if they get the 16 and they do that consistently over the period of performance, um, then they get an incentive for that. And that really is to motivate the team to kind of keep trying to uh, figure out these problems. And it's not a, you know, we don't have a de-incentive, but we do definitely look at contract performance. So. Um, and we also measure the, the work in progress size and how much, how big is that. But we don't actually have that as a metric that's a contractual metric. So while it's important to track for your team, it doesn't necessarily always have to be a contract method or it doesn't have to be incentivized. And this is where we really had a strategy session about what makes sense to incentivize and what makes sense to track and not incentivize. I know that um, 
you know, a couple of years ago, they came back and said there's a big, uh, you know, government push to not do award fees and incentive fees. But really, it's it's the paying the companies that we have working to do the job that we pay that we hire them to do. And I think that's where a lot of the problems we're getting in is that we were just giving, you know, award and incentive to uh, companies who were just doing like the they've met all their targets. But we really want to pay for exceptional service, and because that actually means a lot more to our customers to getting more of their what they want on the website done quickly. And in the environment like uh, uh, at the White House with uh, everybody who, who needs something done immediately, you have to work very, very quickly and you have to have the highest level of quality because as soon as something goes wrong, that ends up in um, the papers. And so that's that's kind of the true test of, of whether or not we're, we're kind of running well is to make sure that we're being reported favorably in the papers and not necessarily negatively. So, you know, we just got to keep an eye out for everybody. Um, so one of the things that we also did was uh, we've integrated cloud services as well. And we, we look at how we've changed the way that we buy the hosting services under this contract several different times. And we started off, um, the original contract had everything hosted in an environment at the vendor's environment. So we had to do the expensive process of, of getting, you know, internet connection from us to them. Um, and it just, we really kind of had to do that provisioning at, you know, in order to, to figure out how much it was going to be was to be able to handle all of the storage and everything all at one time. So that, while it worked for what we originally did, all of a sudden, whitehouse.gov started uh, getting a lot more hits and a lot more people were coming to the site than had uh, previously. So um, we transitioned to a market leading virtual hosted environment. Uh, this was one of those um, kind of buying the Cadillac when we really didn't quite need the Cadillac, uh, but we wanted to be safe. And so we ended up spending probably a lot more money than we necessarily needed to, but we were also, uh, we had enough capacity um, we bought at the, the most capacity we needed and at the at a market leading virtual host environment. So we looked at that and were like, okay, we're good. But then as cloud has matured, um, we migrated finally to a, a true cloud platform. And this one is, you know, it's, it's FedRAMP certified, but we also had our own, you know, individual ATO that was done and, and made sure that it meets all the security requirements of being in, in the United States and, and all of that. And so uh, a little bit later, we added um, multi-region high availability, or Mr. Ha, as everyone in CIO hates me saying. But um, that really, that really uh, increased the ability for us to not have anything go down and have that uh, the the disaster recovery the continuity of operations and allows us to provision much faster much better and in in the sense that we start getting spikes and uh, we start getting a you know anytime there's a huge news story or, or something or let's say that there's a weather event people are going to go to this website first and try to figure out does it have the information that I need to know or the president is going to give a speech on something I need to be able to log in and or I just need to go there and, and watch this video and see what's going to be said. So some of those things we can plan, um, like State of the Union, everybody knows when that is. That's that's a very big you know hit for uh, the cloud environment. But there's a lot of things that we can't plan. For instance, um, there was a petition to be signed that, uh, you know, got a lot of signatures that was saying, you know, release recipe for honey ale home brewed at the White House. So everybody wanted to know what the beer recipe was that uh, they, they used to make. And of course they have their own beehive, so that's kind of, that works out well for them. But <laughs> um, so they posted this and, and a lot of people hit that and, and that's not an unpredicted spike. How, you know, we didn't know that that's gonna happen. And so we look at cloud services in the, in the sense that we are now provisioning and we're trying to buy our cloud services. We're buying at our average level. And this is on a time and materials basis. So this is the one portion that we are doing it um, on TNM because we know that we want to be able to fluctuate, um, you know, just like you would do with your own cell phone. Um, it's, it's a utility, really, in the sense that we're buying uh, what we need when we need it. And so we don't buy at the peak amount. We don't provision at the highest level of what we might need. We, pr we actually provision at the level that says, okay, here's our average with a little room to grow. So we have a ceiling that uh, covers for the year on our, on our contract on that piece of it. But I don't think we've ever exceeded our ceiling in the past two years, three years that we have been doing this. And so we really focus and we put our incentive on optimization and making sure that we're doing capacity planning. So if, we're, if we've ramped up several uh, servers for one big spike, we wanna make sure 
uh, that they that, that it comes back down and that it is at the the correct level so that's a really big function of both the contracting officers representative as well as Lee and the program side that they are constantly checking on this to make sure that we are doing you know we have the right amount of uh, cloud available for us based on what is actually doing but we did put in um, some some uh, you know, protections because one of the things that you can't have is that uh, you can't go into an anti-deficiency scenario on your contract. So how do you uh, have enough money on your contract to be able to cover something in case you do have a spike and you don't have enough funds that you've maybe incrementally funded on there. So we put in a standard operating procedure that basically uh, tells us that we've got a number of alerts when there's a high traffic event. And as soon as those alerts start going off, then the notification chains start happening. So at, at a lower level, it might be the core and the, and the um, technical lead. At a little bit higher level, it, it's the core, the contracting officer, um, you know, the CIO. And at a higher level, then it might even, and at which case, the higher level is probably where you might be under an attack. It might be a DDoS attack. It might be something very serious that's coming in, not just that everybody wants to know what the beer recipe is. But it could be that. So we didn't want to be, um, we're a product of our own success, which is wonderful, because we love to have lots of people come to the website and check things out and really get involved in what's going on. But at the same time, we don't want to have any performance issues because we don't have enough room to support that. So that's kind of a challenge to contract for. But so the, the standard operating procedure has worked out very well. And it allows them to notify me to say, if we to do a double check on the funding, do we have enough funding to cover what's happening? And if we do, wonderful, we keep an eye on it. But if not, then we have the ability to get funding added up to that you know, ceiling amount or figure out whatever is necessary in order to make sure that we don't actually stop the service. Because that would be the unacceptable piece of this. We can't stop uh, people being able to access this. We do want to stop the hackers, but we don't want to stop legitimate traffic coming in. Um, so this is actually kind of a representation of, of an unexplained, you know, a kind of a, a spike that happened. And this was um, in the election of 2012. Uh, it's, it, during the election day, I don't know if you can see, like November 5th, not a lot of traffic, not more than, than kind of normal. But around November 12th, that really spiked up high. And that was because of the petition for uh, Texas to secede from the union. And that got a lot of traffic and a lot of press. And, and uh, a lot of people came onto the site to see whether or not they wanted to, to click that or not. But so we would have planned for the election. And we probably, you know, to see a spike after the election, but it would have been the, um, the petition for Texas seceding. And you just don't know about that until it actually happens, so. Um, and one of the other things that we're doing right now uh, that is really, I think, um, it's, it's fantastic to see and, and really innovative, and that is, you know, making uh, the, the website available to build APIs and, and to get APIs and to get information from, like, we the people. And so um, there's been, you know, actually I can, if you have questions, very specific questions about this, I'll uh, turn that over to Lee. But really it is kind of taking the ideas of what is being promoted in the digital service playbook, which is default to open, have open data, um, you know, use agile um, methods. All of the stuff we've had already been doing for WhiteHouse.gov, which is uh, you know pretty neat to say, okay, we've already we're already on the right page. So we kind of want to show this as an example to say it, you can do this in your own agencies because you know we we still have the same hurdles that everybody has with security, with um, legal, with in fact I think we have uh, data records retention. We have the President Records Act, which a little bit uh, more. Um, strenuous, I think, than uh, the federal or the federal records act, and so we were able to get all of these hurdles met to get these uh, services and everything done. So um, by by promoting that and, and pushing it out, we're really trying to uh, take what the administration is saying in terms of digital service and uh, interacting with the public and making that an experience that end users, the the regular citizens, are really going to look forward to coming to this website and not going. It's just another government website. So um, I'm going to open up for questions, and uh... hi. You said that you had incentive in your contract. Uh -huh. Was that a cash incentive, or was that an incentive of an option to renew the contract? Okay, so under this one, it is actually an incentive fee. 
Um, and because we are on a firm fixed price basis, we know that that's profit on top of profit. Um, so we, we kept that at a very low level in terms of it is just straight, I think it's like um, a cap at 2% or something of, of the total amount for, for those line items underneath that. Um, under other contracts though, under other agile contracts that I've used, I am using award term and um, it is actually going very well and, and the company is very incentivized because that puts the power of the team's destiny in their hands. So the team on site has the ability to control whether or not they get, uh, if they it, get that award term and have an excellent performance, then I can go ahead and give them that option and, and have them continue working, so. Second question. Uh -huh. um, you talked about statement of work, mm -hmm. but in an agile type of procurement, that's kind of hard, so can you explain um, how you actually utilize statement of work that's very prescriptive? So um, I probably misspoke. I don't actually use a statement of work. I, I use a statement of objective, and then they provide a performance work statement, which becomes what they, their technical solution is. But you're absolutely right. It, it is difficult um, to have that statement of work in an agile environment. I think now we're, uh, you know, three years down into it, if we wanted to sit down and actually write the exact process for which we wanted them to do, we could come up with a statement of work because we're kind of, we've, we've been, we know this, but I wouldn't recommend doing a statement of work for an agile software development unless you actually have that, you know exactly what you want that team to do and but for the most part, we want companies to come to us and tell us how to do, you know, Agile or how to do their solution. And so that's why we use the performance-based contracting methods. Uh, you said your task orders are primarily less than a year in firm fixed price. So I'm assuming you weren't executing many, if any, modifications. And if that's correct, then what is the extent of your involvement as a CEO in the post-award? Okay, um, so actually I have a lot more involvement as a CEO in this uh, than I, I do under some of the other ones. And that is because, uh, one, when we first did this, it was a new process, so I wanted to learn as much about how this actually worked. Um, two, because uh, it, it, it is a collaborative environment, you miss so much if you're not part of that team um, process. So as a CEO, I am actually part of the team, um, not only as, you know, as I'm not technically inclined, but I'm able to provide business, you know, solutions and, and looking at figuring out how to do, you know, problems that they might come up with. So we do have some modifications that are related more towards, uh, you know, adding ODCs or tools or something that we want to have underneath there. But in terms of what I do for modifications for the actual software development, I don't really have any of those. And specifically under the, um, the additional, like when we have the uh, components or ordering their own, they have their own task order and it might say uh, they want 10 cycles, you know, at the amount of money. If they need more work done, they just add another cycle. They, I don't need to do a modification to add, say, we forgot to add, um, you know, single sign-on functionality. We wanted it. We didn't originally have it in our mindset that we needed it. So then we go and we say, well, how much do we think that is? Is that two cycles? Is that one cycle? So that's kind of where the conversation with the company comes in now is to say, here's what we want done. How much do we think we can get done within the cycles? So. <clears throat> You said you had many different types of agile type of um, um, processes you could have used to contract. What made you decide the one you used? And what were some of the other ones you could have used? Um, so I can talk to the, some of the other ones you can use, but I will actually, I'm going to defer to Lee to see, figure out why he picked Kanban. But um, so there's, uh, under our other contracts that we have, we have uh, Scrum as being the one. And, and for the most part, that's kind of the market leader. And, and when you look at all Agile types, but there's XP, there's um, Safe, there's, there's Kanban, there's Scrumbon. Um, I think it really is taking a look at understanding what is the agile type and what is the in environment in which they're going to be working in. Also, uh, you know, what what is the ability of the team to be able to manage to that agile type? So if you have something that is very purely you just need developers and you need them going, you might want to have a, a scrum, uh, you know, kind of type for two weeks of an iteration and just do straight development. You don't need all the other stuff. But if you need one that is a little bit more time, 
you need a little bit more end user testing, it might make sense to go in terms of a cycle process where you're not so time boxed by exact iterations. And that's where you know Scrum uses sprints, Kanban uses cycles, uh, what makes more sense for your environment as well as your stakeholders, who's going to be testing and, and how uh, you know will it will it affect them, what your you know management process is. So I would say like there's a strategic decision and um, you definitely have to have that as kind of a round table discussion. The other thing that you can also do is to say, um, especially in doing you know competitions or something, is to say propose an agile methodology and tell me how you're going to do it and what do you need to know from me. And so then you're not being prescriptive and saying I need you to do this. So in this one we actually chose, but on other ones that I've done it is I want you to tell me how you best want to do this and then tell me how you're going to execute your version of what you're propose proposing to me. And if then, I look at that and say, does that match up to what industry standard is for that type? And if they're talking all the same things, then okay, I've got it. But if they propose Scrum and they're talking about cycles, I'm going to say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. So you kind of have to, we're, we're really trying to use what is industry doing, not trying to reinvent it for government, but try to make it easier for us to purchase these kinds of services using what we are uh, available to us in terms of federal acquisition regulations and, and practices, what we can do up to that point. So, and I don't know, Lee, if you had any. Uh, if you want me to. If you want to go, I, I won't go too deep into um, into this, and you can c catch me offline if you want. Uh, it, specifically, the reason we went with Kanban is that it's more designed to work with uh, what either is or is perceived as kind of an infinite flow of work. And sort of when I came in, I had experience in the private sector with both uh, Scrum and Kanban, and actually Extreme or XP, as she just called it. Um, but but. Kanban, in particular, doesn't change much to start with. It's a method that sort of essentially says, what is the landscape as we know it today? Let's like surface it all, look at how we're working. And so it's a, number one, it's a smoother transition. So it's, it's, it's a good candidate to, um, to introduce into an environment that's, that, that has existing, you know, existing people who have never really experienced a, a, a uh, agile uh, experience before, because it's just really sort of surfacing the way that we currently work. And also, I imagine a lot of engineering teams perceive work as infinite, at least in the short term, and especially when you've got this kind of long historical backlog. So it's a good opportunity to sort of accept things as they are and sort of start to work towards a more goal. And what Tracy doesn't actually know, because um, since she's moved on to, to USDS, we are actually have, have uh, transitioned and now are using kind of a hybrid uh, sort of par portions of our work are done as Kanban, and now we've introduced some, some scrum tactics. So, and I'm happy to talk offline after. So you started to kind of go in this direction with my question. Um, you meant, made mention that um, it was a sole source environment mm -hmm. um, originally, and you also suggested working with an 8A. Um, and the implications of going 8A is, you know, it's in the 8A program, and so mm -hmm. if you ever wanted to go outside, so there's that consideration. But I'm wondering, um, in a competitive context, even if you have more than one BPA, mm -hmm. um, is it the white papers or, you know, tell us about your methodology and a general scope that you're able to kind of whittle down to at least who's able to perform the work or justify some sort of down select or an award determination? I guess that's kind of the hitch there. If you're not in a sole source environment. Mm -hmm. How do you negotiate these terms and kind of grow and develop as you go if you can't really substantiate and verify their approach um, and evaluate it in the, in the traditional terms? So, uh, great question, and a uh, couple of, and that's and that's really what I'm trying to do with the U.S. Digital Service is trying to to take those uh, tactics and get that promoted and figure out what is the best tactics to use. What we've come up with so far is that you want to take a new, a different look at past performance. Um, past performance, you know, typically is. Um, you know, what, what government work have you done? What was your IT type thing? And, and when you're looking at agile development, you really should say, okay, what is the culture of your company? Um, who's done this before? When have you done this before? Maybe what is your retrospective on the actual experience that you had implementing the agile solution that you're providing to me? All of those are things that you can absolutely ask. And then when you talk to the customers, um, not only asking about the contract they had, but what about the product that was delivered? How, how successful was the product? How happy are you with it? Um, 
those are all things that you might look in in terms of, of past performance. And as well as the technical side, yes, we're, we are getting a lot of different kinds of variations of Agile. However, you're not looking to compare like apples to apples in this scenario. And really in true traditional performance-based contracting for those types of services, you really shouldn't be comparing apples to apples. You're still looking for a reasonable price, but that's based on the technical solution that's provided, not necessarily based on what somebody else's technical solution is. So you really want to take that, that some of that technical solution and the concept and say, okay, I understand what they're providing. They're telling me how they're going to do user stories. They're telling me um, how many cycles or sprints are going to be, uh, how long are they going to be, how many people are going to be on the team, what is the makeup, the composition of the team. Um, you know, what is the, what are the quality, uh, what are the metrics? I make them propose the metrics and, and take a look at that to say, do you understand Agile and implementing it or have you just picked up a book or, you know, gone to Google and, and done some, you know, typing and figured out like what Agile is and said that I actually am, am proposing this. So um, in that sense, that's definitely what we're looking at in terms of competitions and stuff is saying that we know that you can do this on this kind of, a, you've done this before and we're not necessarily learning together. And there's nothing wrong with learning together um, in the sense that you maybe are, are new and trying to bring in, like we had talked about in the sole source environment, maybe with an 8A. Uh, we definitely look at the modular contracting methods as well. We want to do something for maybe six months, a year, take a step back and do our own contract retrospective. What worked? What didn't work? What do we need to change? How do we need to uh, change the, the statement of objective? How do, what are we asking for that we didn't ask for originally? So, um, you know, I've done multiple award blanket purchase agreements as well, and uh, that has also, you know, a couple years of that, we've really honed in on what the solutions are, where we started with a baseline and, and kind of the teams, you know, gelled. We had some, some ups, some downs. We kind of have got that, that worked out. And now as we compete for future work, they're on the page, they're all together, and they understand, like, what the environment is. So I hope that helped. Hi. Hi. Um, so you had a number of different stakeholders. Yes. Um, and the requirement gathering phase and the development phase then were combined, right? Yes. And, okay. Um, but it's also ongoing. So um, we don't start at the beginning of, of like a development cycle if we say we're going to have uh, three or four development cycles. We have an idea of the outcome and the objective of whatever that feature or project is going to be. And then we work together, you know, with the team to say, okay, um, here's our here's our requirements in terms of what we want to see done. And then they tell us how that's going to actually be accomplished. Um, but we didn't, uh, originally we went through, when we did the first contract, we went through the whole list of all the features and, and all the requirements that we had to do. And we've gotten out of that business now. So the requirements really come just at the time that we need them, which really works in an environment that you have to have flexible requirements. For instance, you never know when there's going to be, um, I mentioned you know the weather event, we've got that hurricane coming up the coast. That might be something that we need to put something out uh, on, you know, maybe a map to track uh, something going on and and we need to be able to turn that around quickly so we wouldn't have known that requirement when we did the the contract so we separate the idea of the technical requirements from the contractual requirements so the contractual requirements is, is set up to do a system of repeated um, services based on the same way but the actual technical requirements that get put in and on that like the Kanban board that is actually controlled by um, Lee in the CIO shop and he works with the stakeholders to say what is it that you need when can we get it what is the priority and here's everything else that we already have uh, lined up is this more important than than that, and that's the negotiation that he actually has with the stakeholders. And from the contractual uh, point of view, I stay out of all that, so um, he gets to have all that fun. <laughs> okay, um, just just sure. a quick follow up. Um, did the vendor that was familiar with agile uh, software development also had the skill set to do the actual website development? Yes. Yeah, okay. they um, and. 
I think also one of the things that um, you know we're kind of promoting in the in this space is that you do want to have companies that are familiar with your technology, and if they're not necessarily familiar with how to do agile, that they start you know that they're looking to subcontracting with companies who are, and having that blend of of things together. Where I'm saying specifically, I have this you know I have Drupal, I want um, you know Drupal experts that also understand agile. So if I was going to recompete this today, that's exactly what I would be looking for is people who have both a, a skill set in Drupal and who understand Agile. But in the world of, of you know, contracts, a, a prime may be a great Drupal shop. They may not understand Agile. Although I don't know that they would be a great Drupal shop if they did not understand Agile at this point. So I will take, I will, you know, take that back. But if you're looking at other um, you know, kinds of technologies along with that, you really kind of want to make sure that they have good, solid pass performance in both. Since the team is so important to the success of the project, how have you sort of put in place mitigation strategies for dealing with people coming off the team? Because we have key personnel changes like all the time, so I imagine the same sort of thing would happen with a small company in this team of team environment. So, um, and and there's many different views on this, but in, in this world, we don't actually. I think we only have one key personnel, and that is the project manager, um, and they're the ones that have to be approved from the contractual perspective if they roll off the team, because it is a firm fixed price environment. Um, as long as they're meeting their metrics and they're performing, and the the um, you know, I think as as Leah said, I didn't put up the bug rates, but we had a bug rate was at 34% in 2012 and now it's at 7%. So we've dramatically increased, uh, lowered our bug rate. So as long as those metrics are still holding and we're still seeing that they're meeting their quality levels, what they do with their team is up to them. Um, you know, my, my boss likes to say, it could be a team of monkeys in there, I don't care, as long as they're getting the work done. And so if you do have key personnel, uh, that might be, it's another tactic to take to say, we do want the team, we want the team to stay, and we don't want to have the changes. But that's kind of where you understand the culture of the company that you're hiring and really what you want your strategy to be. So if you want them to manage it and make sure that they have the right team members in place, they have to be the ones in control of that. If you really want to say, I want the same team and I don't want a lot of changes, um, then you might want to you know, look into having that key personnel for every, per every team member on there. Um, but it's really up to what you want to do in terms of the administration of that. So, yeah, sure. The mic's over there, so I'll just speak really loudly. That picks it up. Um, but the structure incentivizes the vendor to, to sort of keep their personnel happy because the, 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 the cost of turnover now, like the risk of it falls on them, so they're incentivized to essentially treat their staff well. That's, that's how we get sort of win win. And, you know, we've had the situations where the entire team has gone to, um, uh, you know, a, a Drupal event or something, and they make sure that they have people that are, you know, remote, uh, that have remote access, have the ability to still continually maintain what they're supposed to do. So, uh, and we also don't push them to the point that they are getting burnout. And that's where it is really important to check, track that bug rate as long, as well as your cycle rate, because if you have an unhappy team, quality is going to suffer. And so um, as they you know, reach that burnout, then it's definitely, you can see that as evident in the fact that their metrics start slipping. And you want to go in and have that discussion with them to say, what is going on here? And it could be something, an anomaly for one you know, cycle. But if it's a consistent pattern, then something is going wrong and they need to figure out like, what is the management of this that we need to change or what is, what is wrong? And it could be us. It could be that the government is continually doing something. Um, maybe, they're, maybe they're getting direction from too many people and they're taking it all on themselves, which they know they're not supposed to do, but still tend to do it because they want to be, you know, good team players. Well, all of a sudden they've hit capacity and it's not being tracked or it's just way too much. And that's where they've definitely come back to the contracting officer. And that's why I actually sit in the room and have that, um, you know, I'm, th I'm there with them in the contract reviews because I want them to feel comfortable enough to come to me. I'm not someone that is in the, you know, way away and untouchable. I'm just, you know, a phone call away, an email away, because that actually helps with contract performance under these types of contracts is knowing the problems as soon as they start and trying to figure out how to work them when they're small versus when everybody's screaming and everything's on fire. So. Due to your past success, um, do you have, like, samples or benchmarks concerning 
you only need RFQ out for a certain amount of time. You always use trade off. Your eval time is only a certain amount of time, um, et cetera, like as far as the solicitation and evaluation phase. I and uh, my my uh, co-partner in the U.S. Digital Service, Jonathan, are currently working on, on uh, I would say, like the best practices for government agile procurement. We don't have that released yet to that to that point yet, but we are trying to uh, create a site on acquisition uh, gateway at the TechFAR hub. And ultimately, we want to get that to be the place where all of these documents live. And, and uh, we get a lot of people like you guys' experiences and, and conversations and have that. So we, we are doing, we are in the process of doing that and hopefully we'll have that out, you know, um, when we can iterate it ourselves uh, and, and get that on our own product roadmap for, for our team and stuff. But uh, uh, we definitely are, we see the value in doing that because we are kind of getting the ability to see what everybody is doing and capturing that snapshot. We're also working with the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, um, who is in attendance. Wave, guys, say hello. Ha ha, called you out. Um, <laughs> and we are we are working hand in step with them as well um, in terms of reporting and finding you know as that information comes from OMB, what are we finding in terms of trends, especially as it relates to as some of these agile contracts are being reported up, what are we seeing and what are the trends? So as we get more information, we definitely want to provide that out to everybody. So um, digitalgov.gov is also a site that you can go on and look for information related to you know, Agile, what the government is doing. Um, 18F has just released their, um, are, are about to release their first like Agile BPA. Uh, it's their, their alpha version of this, which is for their team, but then they want to do that as a government-wide thing. So uh, along with that, there's probably going to be some ordering guides and some best practices. So stay tuned. <laughs> and when we love to hear feedback too. If there's anything that anybody is doing that you see out there that is, that is in this realm and is having problems or has a great idea about how to do something better, you know, please uh, you know, get in touch with me um, and, or anybody from you know, the US Digital Service and uh, definitely want to hear more about, and, and if anybody's interested in, in you know, if you're a contracting officer and want more training, if you're you know, a, a product owner and need to ha have that, those conversations, definitely match you up with somebody who's doing something similar to what you're doing. And that is really the big thing that we're looking at too, is trying to reuse the same types of things again and again for all the different agencies because they can all work in every agency. And it's just, you have to understand, yes, the landscapes might be a little bit different, but it's a solution that is scalable for the entire government. So. Any other questions? We have 15 minutes, so we have plenty of time. All right, you get you get out early. Oh, we have one. All right. I was wondering uh, what kind of constraints you use in the zoo. Um, I don't know that we have many. Um, we have, of course, the the, the things that you have to have in terms of contractual requirements like 508 compliance, um, security requirements, uh, those are all the, the constraints that have to be in there. Um, we have some very specific security uh, requirements for personnel working in, in the executive office of the president, so that's involved in there. But I don't know that there's a lot of technical constraints that we, can you really think of anything that? Um, Most of the technical constraints were around what Tracy said already, around security, access, personnel. Um, and then just we were pretty specific about um, cloud, uh, the cloud environment, as Tracy sort of mentioned this a minute ago. But there's, that, that term is used by a lot of, of vendors. To, um, but, but there was a piece of it that's really important in terms of our ability to, to do our capacity management. And Tracy used the term like buying the Cadillac when you don't need it. I prefer to think of it as like, uh, you know, buying a giant minivan uh, because you want five children, not because you have five children. Um, and so I think we, we sort of were pretty specific to, um, to, the, to what we actually were, how we were defining the cloud environment that we wanted to work in. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to Lee for, for being able to jump in here and, and uh, answer some of those questions as well. And um, I'm available afterwards if anybody wants to have, you know, just have more information or anything like that. So thank you guys for coming out. <laughs>